tonight. It's written in the prophets. It's actually in the book of Jeremiah and chapter 31. Hear the word of the Lord, ye nations, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him, as a shepherd doth his flock. And so what is recorded there in the book of the prophet Jeremiah is something which has not yet happened and which we believe will shortly come to pass in the earth. Now the one thing about the Bible, of course, is it contains lots of prophecy. Uh, and that's of great value because it's useful for us to be able to read the prophets and to make um, predictions based on what is said. And so we can go way, way back to writings of many people years and years ago, and this is uh, in, in 1754, a book uh, was started by Thomas Newton, a doctor of divinity, and it's called Dissertation on the Prophecies. Now, there are three volumes, and this quotation is taken, which I'll show you in a minute, is taken from the second volume, which was written in 1758. So a long, long time ago, and, and what was said there was, was this. Uh, he was able to read one of the prophets, and he was able to read from Daniel chapter 8, and computed from the time period that was there, which relates to a period of 2,300 days, and on a principle that is contained in Scripture, days equate to years. And from that time period that is mentioned in the book of Daniel, he was able to compute a start time for it from history, and therefore an end period. And that end period was in 1967. This is what he said. Alexander invaded Asia in the year before Christ, 334. 2,300 years from that time will draw towards the conclusion of the sixth millennium of the world. And about that period, great changes and revolutions are expected. Rome is to be overthrown and the Jews are to be restored. Now, not all of that came true. It was a prediction. Uh, it was over 250 years ago, so it's an awful long time ago that he was able to make a prediction. But he was able to come to a, a significant date, because 1967 was the year of the Six-Day War, the year in which the Jews got control of Jerusalem for the first time since AD 70. Another book written much later by John Thomas, a Christadelphian, based again on Bible prophecy, predicted that there is, and I'm going reading just a little bit from here now, there is then a partial and primary restoration of Jews before the manifestation, which is to serve as a nucleus or basis of future operations in the restoration of the rest of the tribes after he, that is Jesus, has appeared in his kingdom. So he was looking, based on Bible prophecy, for a return of the Jews to the land. And so our focus this evening is going to be on what uh, God would regard as his people and his land. It says that the Jews are his people, that they are beloved for the Father's sakes. And he also says that the land of Israel is his land, that his eyes are on it, continually from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year and that's really a powerful statement isn't it because if it's from the beginning of the year to the end of the year then we start another year it is continual God is looking over his land all the time now we want to try to to show how from Bible prophecy try to make certain predictions that um, things might happen in the world very soon to fulfill God's purpose. And just want you to think of, um, of this situation here. Uh, these are some pretty horrific pictures. Horrific pictures of um, the suffering that was inflicted upon the people of God. As a result of their disobedience and their movement away from God's laws and his precepts. <coughs> terrible sufferings were brought upon the people. And most of the pictures are taken from the time of the Second World War. So we, the exception is this one here, taken from the uh, pogroms in, in Russia. And it is a fulfilment of Bible prophecy. We might just like to quickly turn there. If we go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and just look, we'll pick up a few references from that prophecy. It's a really interesting 
prophecy which was given to the nation. So we're talking of about 1450 years BC. That's about the, roughly the time of the prophecy of Deuteronomy. And it's a long prophecy detailing the blessings and cursings that would come upon the people. So it's conditional. It was conditional upon their behavior, their response to the laws and commandments that Jesus gave. And it's in Deuteronomy then 28, we'll pick it up in verse 62. And this is in the larger section, the larger part of this prophecy, which details the curses that would come upon the nation. Because God in his foreknowledge knew that that's what the situation would be, that that's how it would develop with the nation of Israel. And that itself should have been a warning to, to them. So in verse 62 he says, And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. So they were clearly warned. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good, and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you, and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked off plucked from off the land whither ye thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even. And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. And it's talking about the time when God expelled his people from his land, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70, and the Romans scattered the Jews throughout the lands of, of the earth. And it's only in very recent times that they have come back. And, and it describes the, the terrible situation that they would be in. And those pictures really show that, don't they? To show that to some degree as to what would be happening. And verse 67 is of quite a great interest to me because I can always remember as a young man listening to a Christadelphian lecture of, given by um, uh, an, an Austrian Jew who was... Um, sent as a little boy out from Austria during the time of the Holocaust and he was sent to England and he was not a Christadelphian but later became a Christadelphian and when he did and was acquainted with this scripture here in verse 67 it brought to mind the words of his mother as a little boy when he was in Austria and she would say as they got up in the morning I wish it was night time and at night time, before they went to bed, she would say, I wish it was morning. Because she was fearful of what would happen. And this was a scripture then that, that resonated with him in, in later years when he started to read the Bible and embraced the teaching of God. Now, we see the terrible persecutions that the Jews went through. It was on account of their disobedience. But things are not like that today, are they? Yes, there is a degree of anti-Semitism in the world, but there is nothing like the persecutions that were suffered by the Jews in those years. So that is the 30s and 40s, and in the 1800s in Russia, and then you can go back further and further afield and find that throughout history the Jews have been persecuted to a, a very large degree. But there's nothing like that today. And things have started to change, and they started to change to some degree in the time of the, the First World War. The God brought about a situation where there was a, a great war. It became known as the Great War, and now we know it as the First World War, because there was another one. And it created circumstances which gave rise to the Balfour Declaration, which is a document issued by the British government, which says they will facilitate the right of the Jews to return to their homeland because they hadn't got anywhere to go and they were persecuted. And then you move on in history and you find that this Second World War facilitated the establishment of a state, or a Jewish state in Palestine, in their homeland. And the United Nations in their General Assembly voted in favour of setting this up 
they voted on the 29th of November uh, 1947 and it was the state was set up on the 14th of May 1948 and so these two great world events the first world war and the second world war the outcome as far as the the Jews were concerned was that they would be placed in a more favorable position having a state of their own for the first time in history since AD 70 now the Bible speaks about a time coming called Armageddon and we have labeled this lecture that it's uh, things that are happening in the world today turning the tide of world opinion a prelude to Armageddon the Bible speaks of Armageddon we might call this the third world war and in fact Ezekiel chapter 38 from which we read a small portion and that portion is the one we're going to concentrate on but it speaks about an invasion of the land of Israel and this will be the beginning of a great um, war which will take place in the earth again but it will result in the establishment of the kingdom to Israel just as God said in the prophets that we quoted right at the beginning hear ye nations he that scattered Israel will gather him as a shepherd doth his flock now these are two clauses from the statement of faith that Christadelphians uh, accept and what it says clearly here and it's based on Bible prophecy is that the kingdom which he that is God will establish will be the kingdom of Israel restored it existed before it was ruled over by David and Solomon and subsequent kings and God overturned that kingdom because of wickedness and iniquity but that's what it is and that's what God has intended to re-establish in the earth remember his eyes are on that land continually and he cares for his people they are beloved for the father's sakes one of the fathers is mentioned there in that clause 21 as Abraham Verse, and 22 says that this restoration of the kingdom again to Israel will involve the ingathering of God's chosen but scattered nation the Jews their reinstatement in the land of their fathers when it shall have been reclaimed from the desolation of many generations the building again of Jerusalem to become the throne of the Lord and the metropolis of the whole earth so just as the land itself in general terms is is watched over by God continually so Jerusalem the city is something special in the eyes of God now then if we are we have witnessed through history the First World War. We've witnessed through history the Second World War. We say Bible prophecy talks about another terrible time coming, but it will result in the establishment of the Kingdom of God. We might want to ask ourselves, where are we in the divine time scale? So let's just try and answer that question from prophecy. And if we look at the book of the prophet Joel, and we were to turn up chapter 3, this is what we would read. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Now, those two things have taken place in the dates which you've suggested there. Bringing again the captivity is a way of saying that they're coming back. The people of Judah are coming back to the land. And, and that happened in 1948 with the creation of the state of Israel. That was the beginning of that process. And then Jerusalem bring again the captivity of Jerusalem and Jerusalem became in the hands of God's people once more that was in the year 1967 so that's where we are I believe in the divine time scale so it's 2018 so what's to happen next so we go on and we continue to read in Joel and what Joel says is I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat so some place in Israel and will plead with them and that means enter into judgment with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and have parted my land so God has a controversy with the nations and this will shortly be acted out on the mountains of Israel now we looked at some verses from the book of the prophet Ezekiel chapter 38 we looked at seven verses in our reading and from that reading what I've done is taken um, I've, I've selected those seven verses because these are the ones that deal specifically with Israel itself <coughs> and, and what I've done is to list all the sayings that are there in connection with Israel 
Now the significance that some are in yellow and some are in white is simply that you can read them more easily. That's all. There's no other significance. The next slide, there will be colours and there will be some significance in the colours, but not in this slide. It's just so you can look at them more easily. And this is in the order that they appear in those seven verses in Ezekiel 38 and verses 8 to 14. There are 15 sayings about Israel that I've been able to pick out from those verses. So we now need, therefore, to analyze those verses because Ezekiel is saying something in a prophecy and we've already seen that from Bible prophecy we can make predictions. Ezekiel is taking us, uh, is giving us statements from which we can make certain predictions and we have therefore done some analysis and I would suggest to you that of those 15 mentionings about Israel we've got four that relate to the recovery of the land. When the Romans scattered Israel throughout the land, the land became desolate. In particular, the time of the Ottoman Empire, where the Turk did nothing to the land at all. So much so that when travellers went to the land of Israel in the 17 and 1800s, and they saw the absolute desolation of the land, they started to say that the Bible isn't true, because the land is described as a land that flows with milk and honey, but all they saw, wherever they went, was desolation, desolation, desolation. And, and so they concluded the Bible must be wrong. Well, they were wrong, because now we see the land has recovered and is fruitful. But this is what the prophecy says. It says that the land will be brought back from the sword. The mountains of Israel, which were always waste, so the implication is they're not waste any, anymore. Desolate places now inhabited, and they've gotten cattle and goods. Four clear teachings. And we can say, we don't have to make a prediction about this, because we can see that that's come to pass. We only have to know the history of Israel over the last century to realise this has come to pass. The next point in our analysis is to look for the references to the people returned to the land. Of course, they go hand in hand with the land being recovered. And there are four references there also. And we read that they've been gathered out of many people. They've been brought forth out of the nations. They've been people gathered out of the nations. And they dwell in the midst of the land. And again, we, have to make, we don't have to make any predictions about that. This is what Bible prophecy says. And Bible prophecy has come to pass. It's true. Now the next comments, there are seven of them. Seven references to Israel dwelling in safety. And I would suggest that what we should be prepared to do is to be bold enough, in view of what we've seen in those two other uh, headings, bold enough to be able to say and to make predictions that there is to be a peace in the land of Israel. Now I can't tell you exactly how that's going to happen, but what I can give you as we, walk, uh, as we continue with this talk is some indicators that things are changing. And they're changing because God has said so in his prophecy. And they're changing because these things need to be in place before that third world war is to take place. And before the establishment of the kingdom of God in the land of Israel. Or the re-establishment of the kingdom of God in the land of Israel. So they are clear messages. And what they say is... Dwell safely, all of them, the land of unwalled villages, them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, in that day when my people of Israel dwell safely. So I hope that is a, a fair analysis of those seven verses, which deal specifically with the situation in the land of Israel, and specifically with the people of, of Israel. And... <coughs> There are more references, if you take the three headings separately, in this third one than in the first two. Seven references to dwelling at rest and dwelling safely. So, we should be prepared, if we've seen some of Ezekiel 38 come to pass, we should be prepared with confidence, the confidence of Bible prophecy, to predict certain things. So, what I would suggest to you is... 
that because there is a reference to the land of unwalled villages, this wall that is built and the fences that are built uh, around um, Israel itself to protect the nation from the um, Palestinian threat of, of terrorism on their land is has got to somehow come down. That wall has to come down at some point. And if we move on further, the war, the problem on the borders, in particular on the border with with Gaza, the Gaza Strip, where the Palestinians uh, amass there under Hamas, and what they do is they um, demonstrate, but not peacefully. They demonstrate to try to get through the wall that is uh, the fences that the Israelis have have um, erected, so that they might create havoc in the land and there are problems and we know that this year there have been problems the scenes are ugly um, and many uh, Palestinians have been shot by Israelis and some Israelis have been killed I believe in order to have a fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 that this situation has to change there has to be some kind of peace however fragile that might be if Bible prophecy is to be believed so that's already started, hasn't it? Peace with her enemies. Israel has had a measure of peace with her enemies of the past. And we can go right back now, 40 years or so, to the time when the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, left Cairo and got on a plane and arrived in Tel Aviv. And he arrived on the 19th of November, 1977. And that would have been at the close of the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath. It was a Saturday evening. And the next day, on Sunday, he addressed the Israeli parliament, the Knesset. And that was the beginning of a process which eventually led to peace. And so the Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, and Anwar Sadat are shaking hands there. And uh, with, in the presence of Jimmy Carter, the President of the United States at the time. And a peace agreement, which has stood from that time onwards with Egypt. There's been no war with Egypt at all has, um, was created at that point. Later, there was a further agreement with the Palestinians. Now, admittedly, this is not something that's been lasting. It's not been a tremendous success. Um, but the actual handshake there between the Palestinian um, PLO liberation uh, uh, organization leader Yasser Arafat and the Israeli Prime Minister would, would never have been thought possible. It did happen even though there is not a real lasting peace in that occasion on that occasion. And what we have also is agreement shortly afterwards with Jordan and Israel, the Jordan Israel Peace Treaty, which has again that has lasted um, since uh, October 1994. Now more recently there's been another development, and that development is that the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has recognized the right of Israel to have its own land. And, and that's come about because Saudi Arabia and Israel have a common, common enemy in Iran. And so the fact that Israel is speaking out against Iran has brought together some of the more moderate Arab states and seen that they've got some kind of connection with Israel. And so it, it was reported earlier this year in the Times of Israel that the Palestinians and the Israelis have right to their own land, said the Saudi Crown Prince. He recognized Israel's right to exist. Now we've seen that Jerusalem is an important area in the land of Israel as far as God is concerned it was the capital of, of his kingdom and we've seen that in the last uh, few in the, this year and it started at the end of last year that there was the proposal to move the embassy of the United States from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and that was his election pledge he carried that out and on the 14th of May this year the embassy was opened in Jerusalem um, and that did create a, a problem in the United Nations for Israel but nevertheless it has happened and since then there's been another nation and other nations are considering this, um, this uh, change of their setting up their embassy in Jerusalem. 
I think it's Guatemala who also have put their embassy in Jerusalem. And, and so what we've got in the United States at the moment is a government which is outspoken and incredibly pro-Israel. And this, this, um, f this force that they're, they're using, this the diplomacy that they're using, is to help the purpose of God. Now, these, um, Donald Trump, we know Vice President Mike Pence, and UN Ambassador at the moment, Nikki Haley, who is shortly to relinquish that, that job, but they have made a tremendous uh, impact on the United Nations. And the United Nations Security Council that I'll come on to shortly, Nikki Haley has, has made incredible um, gains as far as Israel is concerned in the things that she has said. And I just want you to, to hear this little clip here. There's one more principle I knew before I arrived at the UN. Like most Americans, I knew what the capital of Israel was. To be more clear, I knew that Jerusalem was, is, and will always be the capital of Israel. This is not something that was, I love you too. This was not something that was created by the location of an embassy. This is not something that was created by an American decision. America did not make Jerusalem Israel's capital. What President Trump did, to his great credit, was recognize a reality that American presidents had denied for too long. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. That's a fact. And President Trump had the courage to recognize that fact when others would not. Sometime in the future, the day will come when the whole in the world recognizes that fact. Now it's quite an amazing statement because that's what the Bible says. It's not going to come about in the way that she envisages, I'm sure, but it is going to come about in the way that God has set out in his word. In Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 17 he says that at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord and all nations shall gather themselves unto it. Now we mentioned her because she has impacted greatly on the status of Israel within the United Nations. And we just want to explore a couple of things now in, in, uh, as to, to see how that change is taking place. So the United Nations, um, UNESCO, um, has, is famous for making statements which, um, which are very much anti-Israel. And, and they took a, 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 a vote, they denied that uh, Jerusalem had any connection with uh, the Israeli nation. And so what, what was done was um, a little bit of the Arch of Titus um, was uh, copied. This is the menorah being taken away by the Romans when they conquered Jerusalem in AD 70. And the Arch of Titus, um, which is there... Uh, you can see that for yourself in Rome today to go and see it it's there it's evidence that there was a connection a historic connection with the land of Israel and yet there are things being passed in the United Nations which um, would argue uh, against that or try to argue against that trying to rewrite history now UNESCO particularly has been uh, critical of Israel in many many ways but an interesting development took place not that long ago there was um, a need to have a new leader for the UNESCO and the, the likely person to take that role next was a Qatari gentleman um, and he was expected to get this role but because Qatar are taking a particular stance in the crisis in Yemen some of the Arab countries that would have normally supported Qatar voted against Qatar. And who has ended up as the head of UNESCO? It is uh, a Moroccan Jew who is now in control, which is a, just a slightly interesting development. This is the Security Council of the United Nations, the Chamber of the United Nations, where many debates are, are carried out, many important votes are carried out. And um, we'll come on to this in a second, but when the embassy um, was uh, a declaration that the embassy for, for the United States would be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. There were votes in the Security Council 
and in the United Nations General Assembly. And the United Nations General Assembly, which has no teeth, um, like the Security Council, there's the vote there that there were 128 voted in favour of condemning the plan to move the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Nine against and 35 abstained. And there were also others, 20 odd, I think, who didn't um, participate in the vote. They were not present at the time. Now, the Security Council vote occurred prior to that. And it was the first time for five years that the United States had used its veto in the Security Council. There are five permanent members of the Security Council. That is United Kingdom, United States, uh, Russia, China and France. And those five permanent members have the right of veto. And so if all other nations, the 15 members in, uh, that form the Security Council, if they vote in one direction and one of the permanent members uses a vote, uh, uses their veto, then the matter isn't carried. And she, Nikki Haley, used her veto on behalf of the United States on that occasion, whereas there were 14 who voted to condemn the United States. Um, she voted against, and therefore the motion wasn't carried at all. And she has continually started to stick up for, for Israel in the United Nations. Some of the statements that she makes in her speeches. The days of Israel bashing are over. There's a new sheriff in town. We don't have a greater friend than Israel. And when she was asked to shut up by um, the, a Palestinian uh, representative, she said, I will always be respectful, but I will not shut up. Uh, and so that is the position that, that is there in the moment in, in the United Nations. One thing in particular which is of interest is that every month the United Nations Security Council has a debate on the Middle East. And this debate was continually bringing up the problems in Israel and condemning Israel. Um, she's changed all that and she's got them to realise that there are other problems in the Middle East. Yemen, Syria, uh, Hamas, Iran, Iraq, all those problems. And they, those problems were being ignored in the Security Council, which is, is there to try to ensure that peace reigns. And continually this meeting was being directed at criticizing Israel. So that's something that has changed. And I suggest that this tide is turning slightly in favor now of Israel. We're going to look at another heading now, which is we've entitled Israel is Embracing the World. And I want to go back to a speech by the Prime Minister of Israel in 2015. Now, there's a more up-to-date speech that you can pick up on YouTube where he addressed the United Nations General Assembly in, in, this, in this September, last September. So that was last month. Um, and it's an interesting speech because it goes a little bit further than just some things that we're going to look at now. But this definitely sets, sets the scene. Um, and as we look at some of the words he said, and we're going to hear a little clip from it also, we'll find that um, he's trying to show how Israel is an important nation in the world and how the nations in the world, many of them, are recognizing the importance of Israel. Uh, and he's really pushing this particular agenda. So this is what he says, we're in the midst of a great revolution, a revolution on Israel's standing among the nations. In recent years, Israel has provided intelligence to stop terrorist attacks in many countries. Two visits stand out as truly historic. President Trump became the first president to include Israel in his first visit abroad. Prime Minister Modi became the first Indian PM to visit Israel. After 70 years, the world is embracing Israel and Israel is embracing the world. I think this might have been in 2016, by the way. Yet the UN passes anti-Israel resolutions. Now, I'm not going to read the next bit for want of, of time, but the, it goes on to um, show here and in, uh, in this little here, he's talking about this is the Indian president. Uh, Modi and Benjamin Netanyahu and they drove down to the sea to the Mediterranean Sea and got from the sea water and purified it and he said we drank seawater that had been purified 
a few minutes before. And it's interesting, isn't it, that that book that I referred to earlier, Elpis Israel, does make a comment on the connection that there would be with, with India. They will emigrate thither as agriculturalists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth, but more immediately of getting rich in silver and gold by commerce with India and in cattle and goods by their industry at home under the efficient protection of the British power. So, just offering the glimpses now of the things that are happening um, in the world. Um, another clip coming up, Benjamin Netanyahu's a little bit of his speech, and I want you to uh, notice really how, how proud he is, and also how he misuses some scripture which we're going to uh, take a look at in a minute or two. This is about four minutes, though. Um, so, here we go. Of historic visits and historic anniversaries, Israel has so much to be grateful for. 120 years ago, Theodore Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress to transform our tragic past into a brilliant future by establishing the Jewish state. 100 years ago, the Balfour Declaration advanced Herzl's vision by recognizing the right of the Jewish people to a national home in our ancestral homeland. 70 years ago, the United Nations further advanced that vision by adopting a resolution supporting the establishment of a Jewish state. And 50 years ago, we reunited our eternal capital, Jerusalem, achieving a miraculous victory against those who sought to destroy our state. Theodore Herzl was our modern Moses, and his dream has come true. We've returned to the Promised Land, revived our language, ingathered our exiles, and built a modern, thriving democracy. Tomorrow evening, Jews around the world will celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of our new year. It's a time of reflection, and we look back with wonder at the remarkable, the miraculous rebirth of our nation. And we look ahead with pride to the remarkable contributions Israel will continue to make to all nations. You look around you. And you will see these contributions every day in the food you eat, the water you drink, the medicines you take, the cars you drive, the cell phones you use, and in so many other ways that are transforming our world. You see it in the smile of an African mother in a remote village who, thanks to an Israeli innovation, no longer must walk eight hours a day to bring water to her children. You see it in the eyes of an Arab child who has flown to Israel to undergo a life-saving heart operation. And you see it in the faces of the people in earthquake-stricken Haiti and Nepal who were rescued from the rubble and given new life by Israeli doctors. As the prophet Isaiah said, I have made you a light unto the nations, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. Today, 2,700 years after Isaiah spoke those prophetic words, Israel is becoming a rising power among the nations. And at long last, its light is shining across the continents, bringing hope and salvation to the ends of the earth. Happy New Year. Shana Tova from Israel. Thank you. ...on his use of scripture in a minute or two, but just to um, reinforce some of the points that he was making, uh, the blue that you see on the map, coloured there, is all the countries that have diplomatic relations with Israel, which is quite extensive. And the other half of the world here, again, you can see 
that a lot of countries have diplomatic relations with Israel. And that might be surprising to some. Very recently, again this year, there were some major surveys ranking Israel as among the most powerful innovative countries. And that other heading at the bottom, sir, Netanyahu crows at Israel's listing as the world's eighth most powerful country. And therefore, they are a, a, a country that has a degree of wealth. And part of those verses that we read, that we haven't yet focused on, talks about um, the invader being challenged and questioned, are you coming to take a spoil, is the question here. Um, so, now, just want to, I'm going to comment on his words in a minute, but we just need to um, look at uh, a, a verse. I'd like to go to a verse in, his, in Leviticus. I'd like to take um, Leviticus chapter 18, just very quickly, to show what God says and what God thinks about the way in which people behave. And this was at the time when this uh, nation had come out from Egypt. They'd grown into a nation in Egypt, but they were enslaved, and God brought them out. And he was going to take them into another land called the land of Canaan, which is in fact the land of Israel. And they were in the wilderness. And he gave them some warnings. And in Leviticus chapter 18, he said this. After the doings, verse 3, of the land of Egypt where he dwelt, he shall not do. So the first thing was, he said, I brought you out from Egypt. I'm not going to expect you now to go back to adopt Egyptian culture like you've been used to. To embrace Egyptian religion like you perhaps did. I want you to be different. I don't want you to go back there. I want you to leave all that behind. And then he says, And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, ye shall not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. And the doings of the land of Canaan were that much worse, that which m much more depraved than those things that happened in the land of Egypt. And you may think, well, why was God going to take them from one place and put them into another place? It was because God gave them license to destroy the inhabitants of Canaan for their wickedness. That's what they were intended to do. But in the process of doing that, there was a possibility that they might become involved in those things which were Canaanitish. They might embrace them. And God was warning them not to do that. And so the rest of the chapter of Leviticus chapter 18 warns against these abominable practices that Israel should completely remove from their agenda as they were going into the land. It turned out they didn't go in for another 38 years. But, but that's what the warning was. And some of these practices are now being openly practiced in Israel itself. And remember, Israel is God's land and the people are God's people. And yet we find that Tel Aviv is the gay capital of the Middle East. And I won't uh, show that picture too, uh, too much, but you, there's the Leviticus 18 verse. And there's another one, if we had time, to turn up in Leviticus chapter 20. So these practices God considers are abominable, and yet they are taking place in, in, in his land. Um, and Israel was warned then, and it is warned now, that this sort of situation cannot be allowed to continue. That is one reason why God is to bring judgments upon his people. Another reason, we return now to the speech of Netanyahu. And I'm not going to read all of that. That's some of the words you've heard already. Um, but I'm going to just look at this quotation here. I have made you a light unto the nations, bringing salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now those words are applicable to the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ who his ancestors took, killed the prince of life, says the scripture, and desired a murderer to be delivered unto them. And he's using that, this, this verse, he's saying that Israel itself, the people themselves, he's using this verse to say that's what this verse is referring to. That Israel is by their technology, by their brilliance, is going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. No way will that happen. Because this verse is speaking about the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so we might want to put some questions to Prime Minister Netanyahu that those words spoken by Isaiah are God's words and they apply to the greatest man that ever lived. Yes, he was a Jew too and your nation rejected his claim of messiahship and you handed him over to your enemies and they crucified him. Because of your continual, continued refusal to acknowledge him and because of your proud boasting and your own achievements, be warned. For the words of the other prophets clearly show that there is one final judgment to come. And the reference there is to the time of Jacob's trouble, which you can read about in Jeremiah chapter 30. And it is of interest, isn't it, that earlier this year, we find Benjamin Netanyahu alongside the pre uh, president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, at the annual Moscow parade, where he was seeing displayed before him all the tanks and the soldiers and above in the sky the airplanes and aircraft that were going across. And these very things that might be used against him because we believe and make another prediction from Ezekiel 38 that it is an invader that is to come upon the land of Israel from the north and that can be identified with Russia. And yet he seems to be um, palling up with this man. Um, and we won't look at a, uh, won't look at that one now. But this is what um, we read in in uh, Isaiah chapter ten, and it's a warning to to Israel. We read this in Isaiah chapter ten in connection with the way in which Israel sought help from other nations um, and and rejected any uh, any reliance upon their Creator. So it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. So there is a time coming, which is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's coming because of the continual uh, rejection of Jesus as, their, as the Jewish Messiah, the secularization of the nation, the immense trust and self-confidence that the nation has in its own strength and its own ability and refuses to acknowledge the help that God can give unto it. But we know that day is, is coming. We know that there will be uh, a way of escape because God is to send his son back to the earth as the prophet Isaiah says, quoted by the Apostle Paul in the in the, in the epistle to the Romans that the deliverer shall come out of Zion and turn away ungodliness from Jacob but first there has to be this final judgment which God will bring upon his people it will come in a time which Ezekiel speaks about and so we are looking for signs in the world and I hope we've been able to see some of them which are giving us glimpses of the possible peace however fragile however short lived it might be that there must be in the land of Israel. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Thank you.